John McMullen joins us now on the Boy Wakanda Hotline. We know the combine is going on today, but in bigger news, he's back. Brandon Graham has re-signed, and I think that, John, you can elaborate a little bit more, but I think there were a lot of people who were unsure if Brandon will be back. And I think there's a couple of different ways we can look at this, but I first want to get your initial reaction when the Eagles made the announcement that Brandon Graham will be back for the next three years. Uh, pleasantly surprised. Uh, I did not think he would be back. And I mentioned I thought it would be a mistake uh, if the Eagles didn't bring him back for a number of reasons, starting with the on-field stuff. But I think behind the scenes as well, uh, locker room leader, good guy, uh, energy guy. Uh, he's sort of the guy where where he's looked to to get you through the grind uh, of practices each and every day because of uh, the way he goes about his business. And I think he's important for uh, teaching younger players how to be professionals, all those intangible type of things. And uh, as I said, oh, by the way, he's a really, really good football player. Uh, if you look at the last three or four years of his career, he's been one of the best uh, uh, edge rushers in this league. I know people who don't understand and just look at sack numbers will say that's not true, but if you look at the pressure numbers and the fact that he's consistently, consistently in the top five, uh, leads this team, uh, he, he's a very important part of Jim Schwartz's defense. Uh, the strength of that is obviously the f defensive line. It starts with him and Fletcher Cox, and the fact that they will both be there again next season is a huge, huge positive for this team. It also is in the positive as well, John, aside from statistically the fact that he's versatile. We know that Schwartz likes to do what, you know the NASCAR package. You know, he likes to bump great guys like Graham and Bennett inside next to Fletcher Cox, too. And, you know, you think about it, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, John, but it's not like we're 100% sure that Derek Barnett's going to be ready for the start of next season. So there is some need for that defensive end to have a guy that you know is going to be there each and every week. And we know that Brandon has a history of playing through injury. Yeah, uh, he, he, you're right. And, uh, you know, he's been very durable uh, throughout his career. You're also right about the versatility, the fact that he has generally played left end and kicks inside a lot uh, in, in pass rushing packages. Uh, now, Michael Bennett can do that as well, uh, and you saw that last season. So to have that versatility, I, I think there is an issue now moving forward, perhaps, uh, I think ultimately that Brandon's going to be back Maybe Chris Long thinks about retirement a little bit harder now. Uh, maybe Michael Bennett. Maybe the Eagles say at 33 years old, even though he played at a really, really high level, uh, maybe they think about going in a different direction there if they don't get a restructure done. Uh, but nonetheless, I mean, if you look at the two, Jim Swartz always calls that defensive line the engine of his defense. And, uh, the two key parts of that are Fletcher and Brandon Graham. So uh, to have them both back, uh, both all pro-level players, uh, that's a good start for this defense. Do you think also, John, that the fact that guys like D. Ford were going to be on the free agent market and the fact that the very deep defensive line draft may have influenced Brandon and his agent to go ahead and get this deal done and not test free agency? Well, no, I, I think the opposite. I mean, I think it was pretty clear. Brandon talked to us on clean-out day after the, the playoff loss to New Orleans and, and kind of admitted, and his agent probably yelled at him, that he would give the Eagles a bit of a hometown discount. Uh, ultimately, he wanted to stay here. He's very comfortable here. Uh, always talks about being the first draft pick of Howie Roseman. Uh, and what it means to him. And, and basically now he's probably going to be a career-long eagle. Uh, and I think ultimately when it's over, people will recognize this is one of the best players 
uh, in franchise history. That's how good he's performed over the last four years. I expect that to continue. Uh, but he could have got more on the open market. And, and part of the reason why is because while while the, the free agency list is really, really impressive, uh, guys like Demarcus Lawrence and, and D Ford, as you mentioned, Jadavian Clowney would be in that category. Even Frank Clark in Seattle, uh, if they can't get extensions, those respective teams done with those players, look at March 5th and you're going to see some franchise tags handed out. And I think ultimately the people around the NFL thought the two guys who would get to free agency are Trey Flowers from New England and Brandon, and they were going to get paid, and they were going to get paid big time, 15 maybe $16 million annual value. And the Eagles essentially got Brandon for right around 13, uh, 27 fully guaranteed, $27 million. But the annual value is about 13, a little over $13 million. And he, he was true to his word. He gave him a bit of a hometown discount. He could have got more uh, if he got the free agency. John McMullen joining us on Boardwalk on the Hotline on 97.3 ESPN. Follow him on Twitter for all your Eagles NFL news at JF McMullen on Twitter. So, John, you know, getting your sense of the Eagles now that Graham is locked up, what do you think the next step in the Eagles' offseason to-do list is? Well, that's interesting. I, I think if you get to free agency, they have to make decisions, and, and I think uh, the biggest decision they have to make is with Jason Peters uh, at left tackle and whether they're going to uh, go another year. I think they should. Uh, I think you could do a lot worse, as you can see, by a number of teams around this league uh, who struggle at the left tackle position. So even though he's a descending player, uh, I think the Eagles could do a heck of a lot worse than Jason Peters at left tackle. Uh, Tim Jernigan, they're not going to pick up, uh, obviously, the the $11 million salary. That's not going to work. So uh, if they can't work out an extension, uh, he's going to have to be uh, released and become a free agent. So those are some of the bigger ones. But I think the biggest would be Jason Peters and how are they going to uh, answer that left tackle question and to me, there's no better option uh, than having Jason for one more season. So ultimately, I think they'll work something out, but it's something to keep an eye on. Speaking of big free agents, uh, there's a guy who signed in Philadelphia named Bryce Harper. You might have heard of him. And <laughs> he has gone on social media and is now trying to recruit Le'Veon Bell to come to the Eagles. Uh, your thoughts on that kind of thing, John? Uh it's nice. It's nice to ingratiate Bryce to the fan base, uh, and I think they'll like him for it. But I, I've talked about Le'Veon a, lo a lot. He he did not sit out an entire season to take less money. I, I think if you you make the comparison uh, with the Harper contract, well, it's 13 years and and what is it, 330 million, and it just boggles people's minds he could have got a heck of a lot more uh in annual value if he took a a, a shorter term contract well, john from, he, you have a guy in harper he's a guy whose his annual value is about 14th in baseball right now and he's a top yeah, five player exactly he took a discount now granted he got to 13 years <laughs> i mean that's that's pretty impressive and he had the total money is the largest contract ever, but yeah, annually he, he it's actually a very, very team friendly number for the Phillies. Um, if Le'Veon Bell would have that similar uh, mentality and want to take less money to come to Philadelphia uh, to come to a contender, uh, maybe you could talk about Le'Veon Bell to the Eagles. I, I just don't think that is a legitimate way to look at this. He wants, as they say in the NFL, he wants the bag. He wants the money. He wants to be the highest paid 
running back in history, and he wants to set a new standard and sort of a new position. That's sort of a running back one, wide receiver two, and create this hybrid position that gets paid all this money. And if that's his goal, well, the Eagles aren't going to get involved in that. John, at the uh, Combine today, Kyler Murray has a press conference with the media, and he's saying some, shall I call them strange things. Speaking of Bryce Harper, they asked him about if Bryce Harper and Manny Machado's big deals make him consider going back to baseball. And Murray replied and said, quote, everyone makes a big deal about him making $300 million. There's quarterbacks who make more than him. Um, I don't think Kyler Murray understands Not football yet. economics very well. <laughs> No, not yet. I think Peyton Manning retired 260, 265 million, which yeah. isn't bad. But I understand that you can get to those numbers if you're a stu- superstar quarterback for a very, very long time in the NFL. But the difference is you got to produce for that very long time, and you have to be an elite level quarterback for that entire time. Whereas we know as as soon as Bryce Harper signed that contract, he is guaranteed $330 million. Right. And that's the difference. No matter what happens, uh, he's getting that money. And in the NFL, as I said, you have to keep producing. You might be great for three, four years. You might get injured. That's it. Gravy train starts, stops rolling. You might have an extra year guaranteed or something of that nature. But I think I've talked with you about this before, or it might have been Mike. Look, if if the option is baseball or football and you're good at both, if you want security, it's not even a question. It's baseball, and it's baseball by a country mile. Mm. There's just much, much more security. Keller Murray also confirmed at his presser today with the media that he will not throw or run at the combine. He's only here to talk to anyone who wants to talk to him. Now, John, in the past, we've seen guys have the positive and negative of, I'm not working at the combine, I'm only doing my pro day. For example, Sam Darnold did the same thing in his pro day. Actually, people argue benefited him because it was in bad weather. He said, I'm throwing anyway. Compare that to Teddy Bridgewater, who his pro day didn't go so well for him and people believe that may have affected his overall draft stock so you know do you think this could be a benefit or hurt Kyler Murray not at the combine only doing the pro day workouts well uh, I think it could be both Uh, it's largely dependent on individual people individual decision makers individual teams a lot of people will say Look, if you're competitive, you want to throw, you embrace it, you want to be involved, things of that nature, and they and they hold it against you. Other people say it's not that big of a deal. He'll throw it as pro day. If he throws well, uh, that's all I'm concerned with. And if you think he's a good prospect, you move forward. So I, I do think it's sort of an individual preference. But there are certainly some old-school scouts who will say and look at that and say, he's not competitive uh, enough for me. And they might, uh, as I said, either look in a different direction or grade him down a little bit. So I I think it depends uh, on the individual. Kyler Murray is also a very interesting case, John, because now that we're finally over this whole stupid height thing and all that other garbage because at the end of the well, day I don't know if we're over that. Well, I'm over it. That's a, that's <laughs> another individual thing. I mean, some people believe look, I, I and I kind of talked about this with Mike a little bit yesterday as well. I, I don't think it's common sense if you're playing quarterback, it's helpful if you're six three, six four, uh six five, but there are other traits. But right. yeah, I mean it's easier if you can see over it. <laughs> The offensive lineman, it, it, so, but other guys, whether it's Russell Wilson, Drew Brees, shorter quarterbacks, you want to go all the way back to Fran Tarkington, they have other traits that have made them successful. So it, it's not saying you can't be successful, 
it's just a hurdle you have to overcome. It's 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 difficult to play that position when you're five foot ten inches tall. I I think that's a a fair statement. Yeah, I don't want to sound like a guy on, on an old man on the porch, you know, crying about the good old days. But you know, for me, John, I feel like a lot of these measurables actually hurt teams' ability to evaluate these players. To me, either you play or you can't play. You go back to the year Drew Brees, his final two years at Purdue, he played with nobody. There was no NFL pros on that Purdue team, and he was putting up big numbers compared to other quarterbacks around the country. You could watch him, and you saw there's something about this guy. Russell Wilson, whether it was at NC State or Wisconsin, also not playing with a bunch of NFL guys showed how good he was. I think sometimes that things like passing records, hand size, you know, 40 times, I think a lot of this stuff actually hurts teams' evaluations. I think some of these teams put too much value on that stuff. Well, I would agree with you. If you're a slave to to measurables and you say, uh, uh, look, he's got to be six foot three or I'm not looking at him. Yeah, that's going to hurt you. Uh, but I think it's Jim Jim Nagy who kind of uh, talked about it. He's he's uh, a longtime scout. He runs the Senior Bowl now. Uh, who said, uh, he, you know, most NFL teams uh, they don't dismiss people by measurables. What they do is look at the history of a particular position and say, well, this is the optimum uh, weight height, speed, for whatever. And and if you're, as a prospect, you're not at that optimum, all it means is they have to look a little bit harder at the film. They have to look at you to see if you have those other traits that help you overcome uh, an issue from a physical perspective. So I I do think that's more of sort of a a fan-driven narrative I think NFL teams, most of them are smart enough to realize uh, there are always outliers uh, because they've seen them. They've seen Russell Wilson. They've seen Drew Brees. And, you know, for all the talk of, say, Russell, in in hindsight, certainly should have been a a number first-round pick, a top-ten pick, same with Drew Brees, uh, but also realize they were still premium picks. In Drew's case, a second-rounder and Russell's a third-rounder. It wasn't like people in the NFL were saying, we're not going to look at this kid at the time and and say he couldn't play. They were still high-level draft picks. Uh, But certainly, there are, history says, (laughs) it's easier to play uh, certain positions when you have certain physical traits. And I think that's that's fair. Yeah, speaking of history, that's actually one of my favorite draft day trades of football history. The Chargers trade the first overall pick and walk away with two Hall of Famers. That doesn't happen. Uh, it doesn't happen very often. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, I mean, you can find, and we all know there's undrafted free agents in the Hall sure. of Fame. Uh, one of one of my favorite players I've ever covered was John Randall, and the draft was 12 rounds. Mm-hmm. Nobody drafted him, and that could arguably be the greatest interior pass rusher of all time. And he didn't get drafted because of his size. He, he's short, uh, six foot. He weighed about 250 pounds. And if you're a defensive tackle and you weigh six foot, you're six foot 250, people are going to hold that against you. They held it against Aaron Donald. Uh, different, obviously, still a high level pick, a first round pick, I think 12th overall, uh, 6'1, 287, though. Uh, if if Aaron Donald was six five three hundred, he would have been the number one overall pick. Ed Oliver is going through the same thing now, same right. exact thing. Guy's so explosive, dominates on film, but he's he's six one, uh, two eighty five. So people have some concerns, but ultimately he'll be a great player. He'll be a first round pick. Uh, and, and I think he'll be one of the best players in this draft. Uh, but it, it's right to look at, at certain positions and say you have to overcome some things if you don't have uh, certain certain attributes. 
John, uh, just to make a quick uh, news update here with the Cowboys as well for the NFC East people out there. Uh, David Irving of the Cowboys has been suspended indefinitely for violating the policy <laughs> of a program of substance abuse per the NFL, blah, blah, blah. So now you have two defensive linemen, pass rushers for the Cowboys. Him and Gregory are now pretty much, I want to say they're done complete with their careers, but they're probably done in Dallas. You know, How do you think this changes Dallas' offseason approach when it comes to trying to retool that defense that, for the most part, was arguably one of their strengths last year? Not yet. It, it was good. Their defense was, was a real strength, uh, especially uh, when you talk about DeMarcus Lawrence, who I do think will be back. Uh, hopefully they can work out a long-term deal. That's what they're trying to do. We talked a lot about Leighton Vander Ess and Jalen Smith at, at, at linebacker. Uh, and how good they've become. But I think this is the sixth or seventh year in a row uh, the Cowboys will have a, a player suspended, defensive player suspended, uh, at the beginning of the year. I, I've said it for a while. You know, Jerry Jones has been pretty consistent and said he believes in second chances. And at, at some point, you got to look at your decision making. And, and, uh, if there are red flags, Randy Gregory to me would be the better indication uh, because he had so many issues, uh, uh, addiction issues. It's probably not going to work out. Uh, and, and you can roll the dice and you can hope. Uh, but if you're going to try uh, to win games and win playoff games and, and hopefully win a Super Bowl, you got to make better decisions. And I, I, I do think they should revisit their decision-making when it comes to players that have some, some red flags. Yeah, I don't think, John, Jerry Jones understands the difference between giving guys second chances and being a good judge of character. I think there's a, those are two totally different things that someone like Jerry Jones— Look, every football team's made mistakes. Bill Belichick drafted Aaron Hernandez, okay? Every football team makes mistakes, but, you know— it, you're not always going to get the character judgment right, but I feel like Jones has a track record, not just the last few years, John, but of 20-some years, that he keeps giving guys chances that probably don't deserve those second and third chances. And, you know, maybe Jerry was just a little bit better judge of character and, and not so bent out of shape on giving guys chances. You know, maybe the Cowboys have less guys getting suspended all the time. Yeah, I... I... I, I... I don't know if it's about uh, second chances. Uh, I mean, if you look at a Greg Hardy uh, and and bringing in people from the outside, uh, who was obviously a star in Carolina, uh, that's more of of the second traditional second chance. Uh, When it comes to drafting guys, I, I think ultimately their history has proven that they just don't put much stock into those red flags that other other teams do. And that's the part I think they need to revisit because it seems like they're getting consistently bit by it. So, uh, I mean, yeah, there are talented players, uh, but uh, and Gregory would be a perfect example of that because if he didn't have the issues, he probably would have been a top 10 pick. I mean, that's how much talent he had as an edge rusher. Um, but people were concerned he wouldn't be able to stay on the field. So you can talk about somebody's talent but all you want, but if they can't stay on the field, they're not going to help you. So ultimately, maybe you take a lesser talented guy uh, who is able to stay on the field for 10 years and help you win a lot of football games. I, I, I think that's just good decision-making. And maybe the Cowboys haven't been the best at decision-making. Yeah. Give John a follow on Twitter at JF McMullen for all of your Eagles and NFL news all off-season long. And, of course, all of his work at 97.3 ESPN.com. John, Evander Holyfield's son had a horrible 40 time at the Combine. Now we get to hear about for the next two months about how he's a workout warrior and he's a better football player than than 40-yard runner. Yeah. 
I'm excited yeah, about that. Yeah, it's 40, it, you know, it is, and that's another thing, different type of measurable, but, yeah. and especially in the modern NFL, you know, one of, one of the concerns is that guys understand they need to peak for the, for the combine, and they train for specific drills, uh, and maybe it, does, it, it, it means more than it should. So when you do come up and lay an egg like he did, uh, it's even a bigger concern because you know you got to peak for this particular time, and he didn't peak. Let's put it that way. I'm not, I'm not even sure he got close to peaking the way it looked, John, but that's, <laughs> that's just my perspective. All right, John, have a great weekend, and uh, we'll hear from you with Mike on Monday here on the Sports Bash on 97.3 ESPN. Take care. All right, you too, John. Thanks.